very good morning everyone on behalf of india fintech forum i am aditya and today i have mr madhusudan the ceo and founder of credit b who has joined me to discuss about his journey as an entrepreneur and how credit b is thriving during the pandemic welcome thank madhu thank you thank you aditya uh, i'm i'm uh, pretty grateful that uh, i'm a part of this interview session uh, looking forward for a great interaction here uh, thanks so prior to credit b you have worked in the corporate sector please let us know about your journey from leaving a corporate sector job to starting your own venture credit b what is the vision behind and the motivation for the same yeah i think that's a million dollar question right so somebody once uh, somebody get used to the corporate life i think it's always that uh, one uh, the, the, there is a specific events or a thought process which is required to kind of get out of that safety net and then uh 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 join this journey of uh, entrepreneurship i think that's a very critical moment in anybody's life mm -hmm. for me it was uh, it was kind of little different in the sense that uh, you know so just prior to coming out and starting my new venture uh, i was heading the e-commerce practice for uh, uh, for huawei across uh, southeast asian countries and in bit of middle east bit of latin america about like nine countries i was heading their e-commerce practice so somewhere i was responsible for their uh, pnl and balance sheet and everything so uh, i'm talking about like what 2013 14 timelines where i was trying to look for a, an alternate lender to come online uh, so that we could boost up our sales you know it was very typical right so there was other than credit card uh, there was no other alternate lending options uh, which was available on the e-commerce world uh, you know even if you could uh, look at flipkart or amazon i think uh, 2013 14 timelines there was only credit card was the only option to avail any product on an installment basis and there was no other options so i tried to kind of uh, work with many lenders uh, to to get them online so what i found was uh, typically there was a, a little bit of a lethargy a little bit of an um, uh, understanding or, or the know how about how the digital world works be it be digital underwriting how do we do the collections and what not somewhere i thought of myself doing this research to kind of ensure that you know these i can provide the confidence to these guys to come online so did a lot of research in india did a lot of research in southeast asian countries and um, while while the more i try to convince these guys to come online and lend it uh, more than them probably i was over convinced and uh, that was the most uh, the trigger point for me to kind of um, further my research on you know how do i kind of uh, start the venture i think that was the actual critical moment uh, where i realized the space where i realized the 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 potential what this particular digital lending itself can have i think i think that's that was something what triggered me to kind of look for uh, starting on my own yeah that's a quite a journey so as you know uh, we are facing this covid 19 so would you tell our viewers what is the new normal for you and your business during this pandemic sure i think uh, uh see the pandemic has its effects uh, directly or indirectly on everybody's life um uh, so i think the the pretty much new normals what we see in the corporate field or the, the business field these days is uh, definitely you know the social distancing in the way we operate from offices work from home has become a new normal um uh, right and of course uh, many people have seen a, a drastic distress in terms of uh, the, the job cuts then there has been salary reductions and there are a lot of pessimism that has that has come into this particular uh, Uh, times but but having having this has been the very generic uh, 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 situation for many corporates or many businesses uh, let me also kind of uh, say what specifically has happened uh, within the lending industry and also what are the uh, uh, what are the options or opportunities also that prevail here right so i guess uh, um, the the fintech industry itself was uh, pretty nascent in india you know so the it has not seen much of stress um there were there were stress events something like uh, there was a demonetization was one stress event uh, there was an ireland fs issue that happened in 2019 was a, was a, a, a second stress event but uh, something like a pandemic i don't think anybody had budgeted for such kind of an event nor anybody had foreseen in their business models to kind of budget it right so that this this has kind of uh, put on the, the the entire pandemic the lockdown the moratorium and what not has definitely put on very unprecedented stress on on many industries and and definitely on the fintech lending or the lending industry itself right so um what's the bad thing that has happened is a lot of people who are in a very early stage of their businesses where they were trying to figure out the business models or where they were having a very short uh, runway with their companies i think um, uh, 
uh, it has it has become a very fatal uh, uh, effect for them that they have to kind of shut down their shops uh, mm-hmm. but what it has also kind of done is that the guys who had a, a prudential business models right so where the the underlying uh, concept or thesis of business was pretty strong the fundamentals of the business was strong i think those guys are able to kind of bear through this stress sail through this stress and then restart the business right so these they are, this has provided an opportunity for many of those guys uh, to prove themselves that their businesses are sustainable and that they are going to be here for long uh, right i think i think the stress yeah. event has really stressed uh, stressed their business model to an extent um, that the, the there is a validation that the models can survive for a, a much much longer time and that's the good news around this uh, but definitely you know so uh, it would be totally wrong to say that uh, somebody has totally sailed through without any kind of an effects um it it has its own effects directly or indirectly for a short term or a long term basis to all the industries and and also for the the fintech industry okay talking about lending again can you shed some light on the collection process repayment and the revival of demand for your lending business i think uh, uh, you know looking looking at uh, lending right so uh, you know let's 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 take a couple of steps back here um so probably you know what has happened i mean there was specific sequence of events and milestones that has happened in this journey i think uh, there was a lockdown uh, there was a moratorium on auto there was a moratorium to auto then there were multiple packages that was announced from the uh, 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 from the government then there was unlocked downs right so unlock one auto unlock two auto kind of things are happening uh, so now the moratorium is over right so there are there are multiple milestones in this entire journey of um, the last 6 7 months Uh, which has affected the collections or the businesses in different ways i think uh, uh, just just on the brink of uh, lockdown lockdown came as a very surprise uh, right it was announced at uh, uh, a specific time and a date and uh, before that nobody had any clue about that so uh, there was a lot of uncertainty and kind of a confusion that that kind of uh, came into many of the businesses right so one of the quickest action that almost everybody every other lender took is to stop lending you know because Uh, we didn't know how long the lockdown would, would, would kind of go on then what would be the impact of the the entire virus and the lockdown on the lives of the people and and also you know how how this could kind of what are the economic patterns would be released so nobody was aware of it so the the immediate reaction uh, from the lending fraternity uh, during the time of lockdown was to stop lending uh, right so moratorium on auto came i think um, i think with respect to the collection started from there uh, the the first form of collection was to educate people uh, right so i would call it as educate one dot one right so wherein you need to educate the borrowers saying that this is not a loan waiver you know so the the term moratorium itself was first time coined um, among the the larger masses you know of course it was a very much of a banking term earlier but uh, to educate the customer uh, the end borrower end consumer what exactly moratorium means and how different is it from a loan waiver because people had always seen a precedence of loan being waived off um, formal loans being waived and what not um so there was that education one dot two that has to uh, dominantly happen saying that uh, this is more of shifting your installments or emis to a future date and it's not exactly kind of uh, um, uh, you know this is a loan waiver um i think i think that was the first set of uh, collection i mean that that i would call it as a collection effort mm-hmm. uh, all right the second thing is once the people kind of understood what what exactly moratorium is and how they could benefit from that uh i guess the second set of the the collection as a collection practice what we have to do is educate two dot o uh, what does that basically mean is how why it is not good to kind of avail moratorium in case the borrower has an ability to pay back uh, right because there is an uh, accumulation of an interest uh, it could cause a overburden on the uh, on the customer uh, right so uh, to educate that in case if they could service the uh, the uh, loans i think they should definitely do that and they should not accumulate the interest for long time right so that is the education two dot now the third thing uh, what what we have to do very uh, differently apart from these educating the consumers was to provide multiple options uh, for the payment you know uh, for example uh, be be kind of trying to uh, break their last emis into multiple emis because uh, there was some stress on everybody's life people had lost jobs uh, people had to shut down their shops because of the cash flows have been impacted understanding such uh, uh, issues from the borrowers and trying to accommodate them by providing multiple different options it's not just about you know trying to say them that you either pay the emi or take a moratorium can we find an in between route the in between route would be kind of in case if they want to kind of prepay their loans why not kind of evade or or give them certain cashbacks in terms of reducing the burden on them 
uh, why not kind of waive off all the penalties what has been levied for the late payments what they have done it or why not split their uh, uh, the last emis into multiple emis so that um, it becomes easier for them to kind of service the loads um, you know so like this we had devised at least about like seven or eight options to accommodate the customer understanding what are the issues that they are facing it right so i think that's the third third uh, step what happened right so so with end of all these things you know what we found was uh, uh, we did sail through uh, uh, very beautifully wherein uh, much of the industry uh, had a loan book of almost 50 60% of the loan books are under still under moratorium that's a large stress for those kind of banks and ndfcs to collect from here on more than 80% of our uh, customers uh, did service their loans right so when i'm talking about 80% of the customers i'm talking somewhere close to about like 20 lakh customers we have a uh, active customer base of almost like 24 lakh people right so close to about like 20 lakh people uh, came back and paid their emis and serviced their loans right so only about 20% of the book uh, was to be collected uh, or went into moratorium for us by by end of august 31st right so i think now it's a it's a more of a recovery stage but i don't think it's a a full fledged recovery stage uh, we are again trying to accommodate the customers based on understanding their issues and their concerns um uh, we are providing multiple options for them uh, and and probably this collection effort for the rest 20% of the the moratorium book it may not be an immediate collection but one has to take a, a view of either next 6 months or 12 months kind of a view uh, to really collect from the moratorium book yeah okay so while going through your site i saw some uh, profiles such as emergen emergency lending and student loans especially semester lending so these are considered to be highly risky uh, loan books so how do you mitigate the frauds and uh, how do you uh, what are the challenges in this kind of funding sure so uh, just before i i kind of answer to that um, uh, i think let me tell you that the semester loans are not high risk loans um you know so i think there is an enough belief uh, what the models are built up you know so the no model if there is some some ndfc or some fintech is running certain model i think one of the key things is that they have definitely done a lot of homework and uh, uh, and they have gone to their drawing boards to kind of understand what are the risk uh, uh, and spatial in such models and they would have modeled accordingly anyways um uh, uh, so just to kind of give you an understanding i think uh, you know uh, we are we are kind of new age lenders um and somewhere we have taken a lead in this new age lending and this kind of a digital lending or per se total digital underwriting uh, relies a lot on uh, a lot of uh, 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 the risk models being kind of trained across uh, various variables and uh, uh, various uh, borrowers for example uh, right so probably we run today we run about like 11 score cards it could be anti fraud score cards a bureau based score cards device score cards application score cards behavioral score cards collection score card there are like multiple of these things these are totally a uh, data science based uh, uh, risk models uh, right so what what we kind of develop now the science to put up a, a risk model while it is uh, uh, can be taught in the schools uh, what is very important is the training set or the data set under which these score cards are kind of modeled so that they can reach certain accuracy levels right so the digital uh, 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 lending and a short ticket lending has provided us that ability to kind of train these models across various customers probably we have in our entire life journey uh, we have kind of uh, uh, underwritten more than 24 million loans uh, loan applications right so roughly about like a, a, a 2.4 crore uh, loan applications is what we have underwritten and that's the training set or the training data using which we have modeled our score cards right so this is a science in which the risk modeling works out rather than saying that is this a, a, a it, it doesn't look at a specific customer or a specific borrower it looks on a averages right so it looks on a multitudes of borrowers and then finally makes the decisions so uh, i think i think that's the science of uh, underwriting um, and and what's the other thing about uh, the digital uh, uh, lending is the fraud right so since since the borrower is basically not coming in any kind of a physical contact with the lender um pretty much all the decisions and all the uh, verification happens on the mobile device or on on a kind of a, a video call what what we are trying to do this there are various frauds that can happen on the digital lending uh, uh, right so trying to somebody trying to impersonate other the, the a person trying to impersonate somebody else using forged documents uh, you know using forged photo on a, a different pan card or different aadhar cards so there are multiple ways where people try to fraud the system i think the anti fraud mechanisms by building up some technologies like 
uh, the face recognition, the face liveness check, uh, or reading the, uh, trying to understand whether the document has been tampered with, the, the kind of photos what they're supplying, trying to read the text from these documents and trying to do a KYC check against the thing. So all these technologies is something what, what we have built upon, right? So I think these are the two important aspects of it. One is the, the various uh, indigenous technologies what we have built in-house and also the, the various scorecards, the risk scorecards what we have built by using a large training set. I think these are the two key things which, which enables us to kind of uh, retain our, our, our loss rates or the delinquency ratios at a, at a very industry acceptable uh, levels, right? Um, uh, so I think I think that's the largest science behind how do we underwrite. But definitely to just to answer to your question and to kind of there is a merit in your question that you know whether do you see a difference in pre-COVID times and then the post-COVID times? Definitely, um, many parameters have changed um, uh, considering the pre-COVID and post-COVID times. Um, many of the industries are looked differently. You know, so there are there are there are a set of industries which are affected um, much more heavily than than the other industries. There are a set of PIN codes which are affected uh, 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 adversely compared to uh, other PIN codes, uh, right? There are specific um, uh, sectors or a lot of people who are even the salaried sector or the salaried people. Um, there has been a reduction in the take-home salaries, what, what they are experiencing in these days. The cash flows of the, of the shopkeepers has come down, right? So, so with this, the effects have been definitely uh, uh, is varied depending on this uh, pandemic. Of course, we are also learning on the journey. Uh, but definitely the, the, the risk underwriting has become more stringent. Um, the policies have become more stringent uh, compared to the pre-COVID times. And it is going to be there for some more time. You know? So it's, it's not a phenomenon that will, uh, uh, we, which we'll do away within a, a month or two. It's going to be at least an, another year phenomenon um, uh, before the things would uh, probably come back to normalcy. I would say that 2020 has been a, a time to kind of just survive and sail through and uh, 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 look for 21 to kind of re- uh, bounce back your businesses yeah yeah sure so with the emerging fintech space in india where do you see the lending business in the next decade i think uh, uh, you know so there is there is uh, one thing that has happened with this pandemic is uh, fintechs were as i told like it was pretty much nascent uh, mm -hmm. there was there were certain articles or certain interviews like you how how we are doing it today i have heard that whether fintech is a bubble uh, right so and then um, is it going to sustain? Is it going to survive? There, there have been many questions around that uh, probably in the uh, in 2019, 18 times, right? So, so I think uh, uh, with the pandemic coming in and what I've seen in the industry is that definitely there are some of the players who are able to sustain such a, a stress event and, and, and kind of sustain their businesses and move on, uh, right? Uh, so what does that basically proves is that fintechs are going to be here for long, uh, right? So it is no, no more a phenomenon where it is a uh, where is a bubble that's going to burst in some time or anything of that sort? There's a lot of seriousness uh, within the players what has come in. Um, there are many. Uh, the, if, if I have to put it in a certain uh, specific regulatory term, um, the, there are NBFCs and there are systemically important NBFCs uh, on a specific size of a AUM. Uh, RBI recognizes the NBFCs as uh, systemically important. At least today, I would say that there are at least close to about four to five. NBFCs, which are systemically important and which are into digital lending or the, or the, uh, basically they use some or the other way of uh, the digital or the technology is some of the backbone of their lending. You know, so there are at least like five NBFCs, which are systemically important out of about roughly about like 260 to 70, uh, systemically important NBFCs. So there has been a shift or there has been a, a graduation in terms of, uh, what fintechs used to be and what fintechs are today. Um, and they have survived through the, the, the pandemic. So with that, I would say that. Uh, fintech lending is 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 going to be part of the economy and is going to sustain and survive for a, a pretty long time right so that's that's point number one point number two was there were various other discussions whether you know i mean of course there there, there were euphoric discussions where where it appears some people used to advocate saying that uh, fintechs are going to replace banks and you know whether fintechs are challengers to banks uh, fintech lending is it a challenging to bank and everything so my understanding as of now is actually both of us complement each other you know, so banks being banks with a much larger and a very uh, uh, a long tail corporate structures. Um, uh, you know, the agility of using technology, the agility of trying to experiment with with lending is is very much not available with the banks, uh, wherein it's more of you know making an elephant dance, right? So I think I think of course that is required for a, a such larger balance sheets what they carry. 
uh, that kind of a discipline and processes are definitely um, uh, are required for a uh, for a system like a bank uh, where they are also dealing with the public funds and public deposits so the extreme cautiousness what they exert uh, is very much understandable uh, right so uh, in that way uh, the banks probably will not uh, jump into kind of competing any of a specific digital uh, lending and then you know try to pose a threat to any of the lenders you know that's that's probably not going to happen the second thing is even the the fintechs are agile right so they are quite tech oriented they are quite agile and everything uh, but what do they today lack is uh, that today they lack uh, a, a supporting balance sheets right somebody to carry a, a something like a 50000 uh, crore kind of a balance sheet or a or a aum or a 1 lakh crore kind of a, of course a lot of fintechs have already crossed the 1000 uh, figure you know many many of the fintechs today have a aum of more than 1000 crores i think more or less they are all in the range of developing their aums from 1000 to 5000 crores kind of a aum that is the stage where where most of the fintech lenders are today uh, but when it moves towards almost close to like a 50000 crore kind of a uh, aum or a 1 lakh crore kind of an aum definitely uh, that kind of a balance sheet is today only available in the banks Uh, with the agility and with the pace at which fintechs want to grow, uh, such balance sheets would be uh, possible for these fintechs only by aligning or partnering with the bank, right? So with this, I think uh, both the both the industries have their own limitations, and uh, uh, each of them are going to be complementary to one another, uh, rather than to say somebody is a challenger or somebody is going to kind of take away. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, uh, so there is the each of the industry is not posing any kind of a threat to one another. Yeah. Okay. So what are your future plans for Credit B? Yeah. Uh, so one is you know uh, uh, largely if you look at it right. So um, we deal with a specific uh, uh, a cohort of customers who are new to credit right. Mm-hmm. So. uh just to give you some understanding about you know what we do and then you know probably then it makes sense to answer like where we are heading towards okay um the entire indian market has only about close to about 25% of the population has some kind of a credit bureau score right uh, be it be the the sibil or experian or any of the bureaus um there are only about uh, 25% of the population has some kind of a, a credit footprint uh, on these bureaus and they they kind of enjoy the the, the credit score but the large masses uh, right about roughly about 70 to 75% of the indian population don't have uh, any kind of a credible bureau scores or they are called as new to credit of course some people are not eligible by the virtue that you know they they are they are kind of uh, not major yet i mean 18 years are low but still the people who are new to credit uh, eligible new to credit market is somewhere close to about like a 400 million uh, people in india you know so that's the masses so i think uh, largely what we try to do is try to underwrite um, uh, the new to credit uh, people uh, in the indian market and try to make them or include them into the financial inclusion is what we call it uh, to get them into the formal credit uh, 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 lending uh, ladder in which they can build up their bureau scores or credit bureau scores right so till date um, more than 10 lakh people more than i mean this is one of a proud uh, moment for 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 the company as well is that for more than 10 lakh new to credit people who didn't have any kind of a, a bureau score or a civil score mm-hmm. we have lended them we have introduced them to the formal lending sector we have built a civil score we have built a credit bureau score for these guys so that they have been made into a bankable customer right and that's a larger you know those are the larger satisfactions what you get by 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 running in this entrepreneur uh, entrepreneur journey right so i think that's what we are into now uh, while we cater to their lot of entry level lending you know while we do some small ticket lendings you know some small uh, unsecured lendings or we do l- loans for their home appliances for their kitchen appliances we do loans for their smartphones buying uh, right so while we and also for the two wheeler buying so while while we do this entry level loans uh, uh, definitely we don't uh, cater to their uh, little longer term loans something like a, a house loan or something like their car loans or or any of or the business loans where where we require the initial capital and stuff like that loan against properties many of those things i don't think we 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 today cater to so if you are asking me where we see uh, post this decade is while we are we have done a, uh, a brilliant job in terms of uh, underwriting the new to credit people introducing them to the formal credit uh, 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 formal credit uh, uh, bureaus um, uh, right so we want to be part of their journey part of the customer journey Uh, to cater to a much larger ticket loans uh, 
uh, in future, right? So that's what we want to develop our abilities, uh, not just to underwrite the entry level products, but also to kind of underwrite uh, a large ticket loans for these guys so that we can be their partner for a, a much longer term than what we are today. Yeah. Lastly, what message would you give to the emerging entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs now in the fintech space during this pandemic? I think, uh, um, uh, I think definitely, right? So it's, it's not the best of the times. Um, uh, and I don't want to be uh, sounding, uh, sounding very artificial here that you know, everything is fine and then you know, we should go on. So what, what the biggest thing uh, for the existing or for already the people who are running their companies is that I think I think uh, there are there are one one is very one factor is very important that survival right so to ensure that the business survives um, and and we work towards various angles of course every business is different the dynamics are different I think the the survival is key mantra for them the second thing is to kind of adapt right I think the the, the things have changed a lot you know the people um, uh, the the shopping malls are shared the people are not coming outside. Uh, work from home has become a new concept. The needs of people has been become different. Uh, a lot of um, uh, a focus has moved towards essential goods uh, rather than non-essential goods in terms of their purchasing behavior, uh, right? So, so in that way, you know, so I think there is there is also a key need to kind of adapt to the current changes, change the business model, be agile to change your business model to adapt to the changes what's happening currently, right? Now, uh, uh, definitely, you know, uh, let me give you one more, uh, uh, one more understanding very specific to the lending industry is that, you know, uh, definitely the, 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 the lending models are going to work uh, probably, you know, once we are done with all this pandemic and let's say somebody restarts the business, it is definitely going to work, uh, work and then, you know, all your uh, business models are not going to go haywire, uh, right? It is one of a natural calamity at a larger extent. You know, earlier, the similar calamities used to be something like a flood happening at a specific region or communal rights happening at a specific region, right? So specific geographical regions is what we have seen. But this is one event which has happened at a complete national level, right? So I think if, if you look, I mean, based on my experience with dealing with the, the local uh, calamities, natural calamities, how we have dealt with and what we have seen it, is that the companies have to survive to collect back the money. You know, so Indian market is not too bad. It's only about whether the company itself will survive uh, to collect back the money, what they have lended out, um, uh, when the when the economy and the situation kind of bounces back, right? A lot of companies uh, are kind of uh, won't survive during this pandemic, and they will not be able to collect back. You know, that's the larger issue. So that's why I'm telling that um, uh, survival is the key. You know, so eventually one one is going to collect back the money what they have lended out, uh, but for that they have to survive with their full strength of their employees. So so that's that's important. Second thing is with respect to the business models, definitely uh, to, to bounce back, I think I think one has to adapt um, uh, to the situations and change their models in whatsoever way so that it can uh, cater to the current conditions, cater to the, the evolving conditions and start lending back, right? I think, I think these are the two things. For a guy who is trying to kind of uh, 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 looking for kind of starting a, a new journey, I think, I think this is a very good stage to kind of do all the research. Uh, because I think all the worst is over and then whenever they start, probably it's all, everything is going to fall back in a good way, right? So whatever the worst parameters for being, you know, the funding that is coming in the industry or the lending that is happening or economy is going to the, the GDP has gone and everything I think we have seen the lows. Uh, so anything that happens from now on is going to improve month on month. In that way, you know, for a, for a new virgin uh, entrepreneur, uh, 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 probably, you know, it's, it's also a good, good uh, uh, situation to kind of start the business as well. Yeah. Okay. I think that's all we have for today. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Aditya. Uh, wonderful. Uh, enjoyed talking a lot. And thanks for the opportunity again. I thank Mr. Madhu, the CEO and founder of Credit B for sharing his valuable insights on his journey and how Credit B is thriving during this pandemic.